about Alex and uh, the work that's been done on his biography. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, invite Bob Anderson to perform Welcome to Country. Asbestos-related disease society. In 2007, also he's awarded 
lifetime achievement by the Australian Blanket Lawyers Association. In 2011, he stood for Secretary of the MUA, Queensland Branch, and was defeated by two votes. Um, in 2012, he was charged with 54 ca uh, counts of criminal contact ar contempt arising from the Bitter Queensland Children's Hospital dispute. In 2015, he was elected Grand Secretary uh, of the uh, Queensland MUA. And he also tells me that he, he's been elected to the International Dock Workers Council, the OCA representative, I think. Okay, can we please welcome him? Caxton Street Legal Service, the whole lot, they've been 
some of the unknown stalwarts of the of the labour movement. They've done so many wonderful, wonderful things that uh, kept so many of my members, both when I was a BLF organiser and now as an MUA member, out of jail and out of all sorts of trouble. That it's absolutely amazing, and you know, really, these three men. Yeah, I just think they just need acknowledgement. You know, <laughs> okay, uh, first of all, and la the last uh, people I'd like to uh, uh, say hi to are Lynn and Margaret Alex's uh, family. Uh, your dad was an outstanding person. He was a, a, a man of great um, honour and great uh, dignity who did so much for working class people and so much for the student movement and understood one of the few trade union leaders of his time or any time that actually understood the, the great need for developing that uh, uh, unity between uh, working class people and unions in the same, uh, very much in the same model as a, as a Jack Mundy type leader. And um, it's a real, real big honour for me to, to be able to, to speak here tonight. What's gone wrong, and why haven't why haven't um, why hasn't trade union, why hasn't the leading and the trade union movement been addressed? This talk tonight is not that of a scholar. Uh, I was I had to leave school 40 years ago to alleviate financial stresses in my family at 15. So this talk is not is one of my own analysing of life's experiences of of a genuine rank and file militant, and I hope at times now of a relatively hard working and I hope still militant trade union leader. In my life I've had three great intellectual passions. The greatest one of all has been a lifelong interest and passion in the US trade union movement, where strikes have meant bloodshed, where strikes have meant struggle and some of the great personalities of the of the entire international uh, working class and trade union movement have have come out of it. I remember when I was a young young lad of about 30 been in the John Oxley Library and reading about uh, Eugene Victor Debs and Big Bill Hayward and their stories were like something out of the the, the old west and the, the battles they had to try to build a union against gun thugs and germs. The other two great interests in my life have been the great struggle between the Wehrmacht and the Red Army between 1941 and 45 and Craig down there has, has certainly been a great so great mate to kick off uh, kick around ideas of those times in human history when by a threat uh, the forces of, of evil were defeated uh, by, by a Red Army that had suffered such losses that you know that are almost and still are almost unbelievable. And thirdly the great other interest in my life has been Stalinism. Having been uh, a Stalinist at one stage in my own life Sadly, when I was a young guy, one thing I didn't put in that uh, price, uh, that biography is that in 1980 I spent uh, nearly seven months at the Marxist-Leninist Institute in the Soviet Union, and I didn't put it in there. I actually, I tried to, but I'm not a bit of iPhone, so I'm sorry. Uh, they closed the Marxist-Leninist Institute down. I don't know whether that was because of a combination of Boris Yeltsin or listening to me at a philosophy uh, exam. <laughs> I think it might have been the might have been the former rather than the latter. I think it might have been the latter rather than the former. I'll give you a hint on about my brilliant analysis of dialectics after this lecture, <laughs> because if you ever hear about it, it's not brilliant. It's the poor old philosophy, uh, you know, uh, professor. He just looked at me and he said, "What?" <laughs> he said, "Do you just not get anything?" <laughs> He said, we, you say, he said, you say something in Australia about your understanding of philosophy. I said, oh, what? He said, a drongo. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, oh, thanks very much. <laughs> okay. And, and so, and, and in particular, the great terror of 1936 to 1938, and about how um, a nation can be ruled by fear, and about how um, how the effects that it's had still on the Australian trade union movement still profound, in my opinion. Uh, what went wrong? <coughs> uh, 
this working class, this military myself is a trade union militant observation of the decline of trade union density and influence in Australia. In this state in 1957, at the time of the Great Labor Party split in Queensland, Queensland had one of the largest uh, trade union densities in the developed Western world. It was approximately 85%. Um, today, 60 years later, it is less than 15% and it's probably, maybe, just over 10% in the private sphere. I talk, uh, tries to find out some of the reasons and some of the analysis of what, what are just not just the objective but also the subjective reasons for this massive decline in trade unions and some ideas so that we might have a rebirth. In the Australian Bureau of Statistics data released on the 27th of October uh, 2015 under the headline Characteristics of Employment Australia August 2014, the following data can be extracted. The proportion of employees who were trade union members in their main job fell from uh, fell to 15% down from 17% in August 2013. So there was an effective 2% decline in trade union membership in one given year. From a more historic account, in 1982, some 53% of employees in their main job were trade union members, and in 1992, some 40% of eligible employees. So today it's gone down to 15%. Already, according to the OECD figures, the Australian trade union density figures have gone from 25.4% in 1999 to 15.5% uh, today. Why is this decline been so severe in Australia and what can we indeed be learned from it? Uh, it can't just be what many of the union leaderships believe, that it is just a neoliberal assault. If it was, the same level of decline be seen across the whole of the OECD, but it simply isn't. David Peake's in Unions, uh, in, a, in a book called Unions in a Contrary World, uh, argues that there are four areas of concern. One is structural, uh, casualisation, industries growing with from, from very low traditional densities, growth in, uh, in certain employment, in self-employment areas, trade, you know, tradies, um, franchises and all that accounts according to peaks is about 50% of the loss. Institutional factors, which he calls things such as legislative changes, um, and he uses New Zealand as a, as a very powerful example of that. The New Zealand experiment when they put in the Employment Contracts Act in 1991 saw the elimination of some unions in, in lots of areas. It also saw that it was the Employment Contracts Act was put in by a Conservative government, but prior to that, they had had a, had a Rogernomics that had been under a Labor government, uh, under um, uh, their finance minister, and uh, Longy and the team, they uh, sort of started it all off. Pete's also talked about aggressive employer strategies and the inability, inability of unions to respond. Pete's is very right in that area. The union's inability to respond to the great uh, to great attacks has been one of the historic problems. I think that we've really we've really got a, a huge problem. In. Uh, uh, what, where in this um, in his book, Pete, I very strongly disagree with. Um, in his in this book, he talks about the prices and incomes of the poor. Um, gave the Australian trade union movement a certain amount of time and it sort of gave us an ability to um, uh, to uh, respond to some of the uh, attacks that were happening elsewhere in the world and so they weren't so severe yet. For me, going through that period of time, I, I have to say that my account of things is completely different. Is that um, what I saw and realised a little bit later on, it took me a few years to actually understand this, is that what I saw was a slow strangulation of a once militant union movement in this country. Um, the genius of Hawke and Kelty was not so much in the development of a crisis and incomes, but well, they've been done in other countries of the world. It is, but it was, in my opinion, it, by the way they co-opted the left. The way that the CPA dominated influence metal workers union under Carmichael's leadership was uh, turned into a prime mover of the of the prices and incomes of court and to actually be the prime mover 
of what one would call the discipline name of the Australian left and the Australian trade union movement. The SBA influenced uh, building, work, building Works Industrial Union, uh, led by uh, Clancy McDonald and Sharkey, was another prime example of what happened. So you had the, the two great lefts in Australia, the CPA and the SBA, one was a, a Moscow line, the other one was Euro Communist. But it's very interesting to see how a section of that SBA dominated and also the CPA dominated all uh, two major <coughs> left unions in Australia came to a common conclusion that jumping in bed for Labor government uh, was going to somehow sort out all the problems that the working class faced in this country. It was a huge mistake. You know, the light of history, I think, has proven that. Um, yeah. What I had noticed through this period was that trade, uh, trade union responses to employer attacks became much more muted. And I think any of us have to agree with that. And in this area, I'd like to zero in on a particular year, and that year is 1985. And 1985, to me, not just because I was involved in a major industrial dispute at, at that time, but it, as a supporter, but it, it had a critical turn to it. In 1985, four things happened in the Australian trade union movement. They're all negative. One, and the first one, was Mudge and Berry, Meat Workers Union, where Jake and Davis um, effectively sought through the help of the Westpac Bank Corporation the almost finding out of existence of the Meat Workers Union. Some of the meetings in the end were up for over five million dollars in, in fines and damages, simply because of the struggle to try to keep uh, to do fundamental trade union principles. The response from the working class and from the Australian trade union movement and its leadership was muted at best. We then get down to the secret dispute, one of the big biggest disputes that any of us, all of us here, have been involved in the last thirty years in this country. A dispute that was over fundamental basic principles that an industry shouldn't be subcontracted out, uh, that an industry uh, deserved to have uh, workers on union rates of pay uh, being the driving force of that industry. Uh, because of that, 1007 <coughs> Lawrence was sacked in February uh, 1985, and a, a massive dispute arose from that. Once again, we saw a very piecemeal uh, efforts in trying to resolve that dispute. Um, some of it treacherous, some of it totally unprincipled, but also we saw wonderful things, as many of us here that got involved in picket lines during that 1985. Uh, there wouldn't have been too much need for us to be so involved in picket lines if we had to shut down the country for a day. It wouldn't have needed much. but. Uh, the appeal from uh, our appeals to trade union leadership, including the, the wonderful uh, appeals that uh, Bernie, uh, Bernie Neville, who's here in the audience, and stand up, Bernie, please, so everyone can see him, is that Bernie Neville led the uh, rank and file movement in the, uh, uh, for the secret workers and uh, saw much of the treachery firsthand. And so after seven months of torturous and difficult, hard struggle, Eventually, the, uh, the dispute was sort of run down. Never really, in my way of thinking, was never really pulled off. But uh, in the end, 1,007 men had lost their uh, uh, working people, had lost their lives. 1,007 families were thrown into the scrap heap. And it took the ETU almost a generation to rebuild. And uh, that had an enormous, uh, enormously uh, dampening effect on trade union militancy everywhere. The third one is an area I don't think that's been examined enough in Australia, and that has been the, uh, the de-unionisation of the Pilbara. When I was a young man, I was up in the Pilbara. The Pilbara was like um, difficult. Anyone who's been up there, it's a hard, tough environment. Long distances between towns, just a hard, difficult place to earn a living. But the unions were very strong, very tough, and they extracted decent wages out of rapacious uh, multi nationals such as BHP and also Consig Rio Tinto with the CRA Australia, who became Rio Tinto. Around the 85 period, Rio Tinto decided um, to 
pick a blue, which they did, and they used that blue then to go on like the Mormon, they were like the Mormon church uh, on steroids, going and knocking on people's door and forcing contracts down their throats. Um, the Pilbara went from a place where there was almost 100% union density within a couple of years to 10%, and today it's non-union paradise. I was up there only recently. Apart from the waterfront and a few little spots, it's just completely non-union. And it's had a, an enormous effect there. It's, you know, you can talk about your FIFO miners not earning 100 grand a year, but fair think if you'd want to earn 100 grand, grand a year just to look at the joint. And uh, uh, what happens is that there's no collectivity in the, in the town. <coughs> Everybody is just, has been atomized and turned into individuals. And of course, in 1985, I think the, the worst, the worst of the whole board process uh, began, and that was uh, the deregistration proceedings started against the Builders Labourers Federation. Um, and that was plan don't, don't anyone ever think that that wasn't a planned, sustained attack by sections of trade union leaderships and and um, and the Labor government. I actually stayed at a senior, um, as a young man, I stayed for a weekend course in, I think, Marxism, Leninism at uh, a senior BWIU official's um, uh, place down in the central coast of New South Wales. And uh, just over a, uh, a state, they uh, having a hamburger. The language that was being used about what was going to happen to the BLF that made any mistake that it was not going to be a slaughterhouse as far as they were concerned, that they were going to go out up the north of the team and they were going to destroy it. And they did. And what did they destroy? Well, in fact, what they did, it was like, um, I don't know sort of what the Shakespearean sort of uh, scenario would be, but um, the sword, the, the sword that they thrust through the, the heart of the BLF, eventually they actually thrust into themselves. So, um, and uh, we, to, to some extent today, we still have a Malaya movement recovered from, uh, from that uh, those deregistration proceedings. And that I believe is by far the greatest sinister, the most sinister thing that happened under the. Under the whole uh, crisis and income support. I'm spending a lot of time on it, as you know, because it's a process that uh, I think this, this lays down the whole basis and the whole foundations of what came after. The other thing that the crisis income support did, and about the co option of, of certain people in trade unions into, into the capitalist system, my argument is fundamentally this is that large sections of the trade union movement's leadership was co opted into the system from where they were never. Okay, trade union officials prior to the prices and incomes of the board didn't tend to sit on many boards. They didn't. But after the prices and incomes of the board and things such as universal, so-called universal superannuation, um, people became, they started sitting on industry super boards. Um, they became, you know, self-proclaimed communists and socialists, started sitting down with employers, and even more so than that, they started meeting with fund managers, you know, the so-called masters of the universe. Do you really think, comrades, that the ideology of, of, of a split of working class movement is going to stand 